long today. Let me get my caption on and then let me get on Zoom on this side. Because this computer doesn't have a microphone. Like that. Mm -hmm. I completely forgot that I have to log into Outlook in a second. I can stop all my issues. Okay, so let's download the notes and then our assignment. Okay, so for today, I'm actually going to share a screen on this side first. Um, we're gonna look, take a look at the lab, I mean the assignments and the notes. Michael's not here, which is surprising. Maybe he didn't get a ride. Did you live far? No. Uh, like a few miles. Yeah. Well, maybe he's sick. Okay, so I had added the lab. Sorry about that. I was trying to test things and then I fixed a few things. Um there's so many different tools for phishing attack, and I kind of want to narrow down something that's achievable for today. So our lab is not too long. Um, your assignment is on chapter eight, and then you can find your notes there. So we'll go over the notes and the assignment together. Okay, let me pull up the assignment. Okay, so before we answer the question, let's take a look at the notes. Um, oh, keep clicking on the wrong file. So in chapter eight, it begins with talking about what identity would be. And identity is one of the first process in access management. We want to identify the user or the system. So there are many ways that we would be able to tie that user to some form or that, that subject to some form of um, information. So identities overall is just a group or a collection of information about a particular subject. That could be, hello, we're just asking where you were. Yeah. <laughs> so that could be, uh, you know, the individual user, that could be a system. Um, Sometimes you have automated systems, so sometimes you see that. So identities is a way that we can correlate that subject to a specific thing. Now, the subject can be individual or service, and sometimes you do see that. So in identities, it's gonna be used for the AAA, right? Security Plus will ask you about the AAA, that stands for authentication, authorization, and accounting. So this is all required in your access control. So in the first question of our assignment, it asks you to describe the processes in AAA framework for access management. And the, we already talked about identification, right? And I wanted to focus on the AAA only. So identification is a way that we would recognize a system or a user that would require a certain type of access, right? Uh, the way that we can do that is through username or system name. 
in the AAA, your authentication is that when the user provides credential, and that could be biometrics or, or uh, passwords, to validate their identity in the system. So authentication works with identity and that it validates who they are. And after the validation is successful, we would see that authorization is a way that we grant the privileges to the user based on, that could be for their job, that could also be based on our company's rule, and we'll talk about different models, and, or that could just be on specific tasks. Then the last part is accounting. This is a way that we can track what they are doing on the system based on the authorized access. So we would log it and we would monitor it and we will go back and do audit on it. So in access management, you start to see a lot more of this. They don't just look at access management, they are looking at identity and access management. How you identify the system or the resources or the user, in addition to controlling how that system or that user access the resources. So in cloud environment, you would see IAM being used. And in a lot of the security system, we see this as a way to identify, right, specific subject that's using the object. So IAM is used to create, so we can create the user, store, and manage identity information groups, permissions, and other information needed to support identities. And identities can be very specific. That could be individual that would have information uh, related to, you know, their health, or that could be individual that just have information that related to their role in the company. So that could be various things. Or it could be your customer. So AIM runs VAS and it could be for a broader scope or a more specific. But ultimately you need to know that it is a way that we can create, store, write grant rights and permissions to specific identities which could be groups, users, and so on. Any question? Okay, so make sure we know what AAA is for all the security certification, especially the CYSA, right? Make sure we know what IAM is, which is identity access or identity and access management. And that you can find on page one of our notes. So what we will narrow down is there are specific systems that are used for this, right? Servers. So you can have a centralized way to really control who's accessing what. And so you can have a, a way to federate it for identity across your enterprise. And so it would look something like this. Your data sources is going to be the assets, right? All your data and where that's coming from. That could be from your HR, that could be from different departments. And then your identity management system is gonna be the centralized way. And we often see LDAP, which is lightweight directory access, right, protocol. So this is a way that we will be able to utilize right, authentication uh, approach or methods to be able to access resources. So if we break down the directory services, you would see the hierarchical like this. So when you're looking at the .com, so for example, I have example.com, right? .com is a root, right? Example.com is the parent domain. So this is called a DC, right? And then under that, you would have container, which is called organizational units. And container could represent division. It could represent, represent region. Some In some cases, it represents a department. So if you're looking at this, you have two OUs, organizational unit, and that's broken into security and HR. Within that, you would have the sub, 
right? So you would have different teams and then you would have different roles there. So you would see in general, it will look something like this. So in, in order to do this, we would use the lightweight directory access protocol, which is carried in a lot of different products um, to be able to provide access for specific users and system. So some of the open source uh, LDAP you would see here, and I put the link for you. So you would see that for open LDAP. We're very familiar with Active Directory. I think most of you have taken classes that talk about AD. And so in Windows environment, LDAP is integrated in Active Directory. But directory service is integrated in a lot of different products like Oracle's Internet Directory, Microsoft Active Directory, we talked about that, IBM's, they call it Security Directory Server or CA Directory. And then you have Apache for web server, right? And you would see some of the open source ones that's used in Linux-based systems. Okay, so to answer the next question, for number three, it says, when should LDAP be implemented and secure? A lot of times we implemented LDAP for the local domain or even the global domain. But in the case when we're looking at web application, right? So for example, you are a student in an institution, you log in to be able to uh, sign up for your classes um, or that you could check your for your transcript, the records of all your courses that you complete. And in the authentication process, it's actually using TLS. So in that case, to really identify who you are to the system, right, it's going to be able to also encrypt that information as it's passing through. It would use LDAP, which is a way to identify you as a record in that directory. You are a user or a student in the institution. And as you log in, you authenticate, you would use TLS. Now, in order to match up your password, your password is stored securely, right? In most cases, we'll talk about the weakness in this area. And so we would want to consider to apply LDAP and secure LDAP when we're using TLS for authentication, when we are securing password storage, because in some cases we're sharing that secret information or that password is stored in plain text. And you also want to use access control lists to really control how you can create, store, and remove objects like files. So on the web server, I have the user login and for that user, they'll be able to do something, right? Like, for example, they can shop. They can uh, also create files in the case where you can upload uh, some of your creation, maybe video and so on. Well, you want to be able to control that, right? How the things, the objects are created, stored, and removed. And at the same time, we want to overlook all the account information as well. So LDAP is a way that we will, we will be able to have a centralized way to manage your subjects, how the subject acts upon the object, which is access control. Okay, so this section talk about LDAP, that's in page, on page two. And in LDAP, there are multiple modes. So most of the time you would see that we would use operation mode. And operation mode simply is the way that we can access the content of LDAP. Anonymous is a mode that we can use without logging in, right? Or unauthenticated is also a mode that we don't need to log in. Now these two impose risk because if you don't have accounting capability, you would not know who's doing what and at what time. And then we would have user password authenticated. So preferably we want to use the operation and the user password authenticated mode so that way we can track and manage the access 
portion of once they're authenticated, right? So for number four, it asks you which LDAP operational modes should be disabled and why? We should disable anonymous and unauthenticated modes because we want to better account for who and what we're accessing the system. If you don't, if you have that enable, that is a way that you would find some risk, right, or vulnerability, um, because someone can log in and you, you know, un if you don't allow them or or an authorized user logged in, then you will not be able to track them. Mm -hmm. Now. In access management, we would see that we would utilize some protocols and services. And these are prone to specific flaws in the design. So after the LDAP section, it's going to go over TACACS. And Cisco had come up with the upgraded version, which was the plus compared to TACAS, which is the the traditional legacy version of that. So on the bottom of page two, it talks about this particular protocol. This is Cisco design and you can find that on page two. It uses TCP traffic for the AAA. So basically it's really a way that Cisco devices can have authentication authorization and accounting. The challenge in this particular protocol is that it lacks integrity in checking sent data and the attacker would be able to access the traffic because it is transparent and they would be able to either perform like stuff packets or arbitrary making arbitrary changes for the replay attack. So all they have to do is scan the traffic, looking at what your traffic would be. They can even look at some of the plain tax information or stuff the packets, right? Now, it also has encryption flaws in that the keys can be compromised because it is not difficult to obtain the key or get the key or break the key, right? So if you want to use this with the AAA, it's recommended that you would use it on an isolated administrative network, that means that we have to monitor and control it on an isolated environment, even though it's on the isolated environment. Okay. So the, the question that you answered there is that it lacks integrity in checking for sent data, allowing the attackers to access traffic and make arbitrary changes using replay attack. It also have encryption flaws, allowing the attacker to obtain the keys. Now, many organization prefers to use Radius Server. Radius Server been around for a long time, hence the name. And I think you've learned this also in other classes as well. Radius stands for Remote Authentication and Dial-In User Service, right? For most part, we don't have the dial-in part anymore, but we still integrate Radius Server is a way for our user to remotely log into our network. And that could be for your network devices, right? Your network appliances like your switches, your wireless router, or it could be for your wireless networks in general and other devices like for your devices. So what that does is in order to use the resources on the network, like my printer, shared drives, and so on, I have to authenticate to the server and that server will allow me to have access to certain part of the network. And so Radius uses TCP and UDP or both, like it would be UDP or TCP. The downside is that security is not strong, password is not strong, and it uses ME5 hash as it is a legacy technology. Right, many companies still uses it because it's easy. And the traffic 
between the server and the client is encrypted. It uses IPSEC. Most administrator, you do have option to set it up with the different type of encryption or low level encryption, but IPSEC is normally the default option. Okay. So for radio server, password is not secure. We learned that, right? It has shared secret and MD5 hash. That means that when it's shared secret, you should be able to obtain the password and then MD5 hash is not a good hash. It's not a secure hash, so it's easily broken. And the next part is on Kerberos. And I think you probably hear of Kerberos many, many times before, right? Starting with CIS 27 and then going into 40 and other classes. So Kerberos is Windows technology or Microsoft technology. It is the primary difference between Kerberos and the other two protocols is that it's really designed to integrate in the untrusted networks. And it uses encryption protected and, and protected authenticated traffic. So it uses the encryption to really make the traffic un, invisible to, to who's scanning. That means that it has to use um, it has to use key distribution center to be able to distribute keys. And I think we touched on this before, but I wanted to kind of give you the overall idea. It's very much like going to an amusement park. It's like using Kerberos. Is that in order to get a ticket to your amusement park, you have to have a key. So think of it like you have to have a credit card as your key <laughs> to pay for your ticket and your ticket lets you into the amusement park, right? Once you're in the amusement park, you're protected from the outside world. So Kerberos is designed to have that untrusted network. It can be used in an untrusted network where the other two must be used in the trusted network. So when it established trust is when system would exchange some kind of trust, right? That could be signed trust, right, using a third party, or it could be some, some way that it would acknowledge that, oh, I, I have the certificate, you have the certificate, let's use our certificate to trust one another. So Kerberos is a little different. It uses KDC to issue keys to the system. And in the, the, the communication where it would look at the keys, this is how it's going to generate tickets. And it goes through a process called ticket granting and allowing, using that ticket, it's going to establish that trust with the system, even though it was untrusted in the first place, right? But there is an attack called the golden ticket attack. It is a way that they can modify the ticket once it's granted. So they would be able to have that false trust with the system. Right, nothing is unbreakable. Golden ticket been around for I want to say close to twenty years now, so Kerberos been around for a long time. But however, right, you know, you do see that the the technology itself is an improvement from what we've seen in the past, and what we and we're still using this. Okay, so on the on the newer version of Windows Server and Windows Client, right, like your Windows eleven and ten. It does use Kerberos. Your password is not stored in NTLM, right? Um, it, it uses a higher or a different hash compared to the old ways was to use the MD5 hash. So definitely a, an improvement from what we've seen in the past. All right, so here you do see, I, I took this from the book, right? It shows you on how when you authenticate. So I'm a client, I'm, I'm authenticated to RCCD server, right? I put in my email address and my password. And what that does is when it's going to check in the active directory, does this user exist? And it says Casey Win exists. And so what that does is it's going to go, and it's going to issue, right, an ID to request a ticket. So once that happened, 
then you get a session key. Okay, and that session key can be lasting for a while or it could be last for however you want to set it. Okay. Normally, when we're looking at like web or remote access, a lot of the times it's only lasts until you click close or end the session. And then once you close it and you're trying to refresh your browser, it no longer have that session. So that way, you know, you don't get session hijack. Okay. There are other ways to session hijack, but, you know. So your authentication is tied to other things that allow you to get a ticket for your session, your session key, and then allowing you to be able to have encrypted communication between your system and the server. Now for the single sign-on, you can see this on page three. Definitely use, you use it all the time when you come here, right? Uh, you sign on to your email and you're able to access your Canvas and other apps. It's definitely a, a quicker, convenient way to authenticate to multiple services and system with using one username and password, right? This reduces the password fatigue, right? If I have five apps, I have to have remember five different passwords. That's a lot. So single sign-on is definitely convenient for the user. The downside of this is that if they can get access to one, then they can get access to all the others. And it's not that hard to, to get single sign-on, okay? So the flaw in single sign-on is that, you know, it opens up a lot of issues with different services being accessed and so on. And so for single sign-on, it uses a centralized authentication service. And some of your open source centralized authentication services here, we're going to visit OAuth today. This is one of my favorite. It's You see this a, a lot in a lot of like applications and application assessment, <clears throat> especially when it deals with authentication. <laughs> um, so you likely would use OAuth when you use your Facebook account to sign or your Google account to sign into other things. So for example, I'm using Ripple or Replit, right? Um, and I would use my Google account to authenticate to it. So what that does is it takes my Google credential and it shares it, right, with Replit or Ripple. And behind that is actually OAuth. So the way they code it is they use an API right, that uses the source code from OAuth. And so it's using that, that um, extension and be able to pull it. So we're gonna see how we can install that on the server today so you can see, and then simply tie that in. So when you're using that, you're sharing your credential across multiple applications. So all they have to do is jeopardize one application, they'll be able to get your credential. Or you can use a third party service, right? Um, you know, there's different ones with the iPhone and, and the Android. I have a Samsung one, so it's shared across multiple apps through, you know, that particular application. So you would see that for the client web app. Okay. So <clears throat> the drawback and the benefits. The benefits is definitely convenient for the user. And then it kind of reduces the password fatigue. Um, the drawback is that it's easier for attacker to obtain your credential and to be able to access a lot of different services. Okay. So make sure we know these. Then <clears throat> when we get into authentication and how we should be breaking it down to different type of models, right? So role base is to your job. So if I have a user that is um, working in an office, right? Um, I would not allow them to have access to systems that is in the warehouses compared to the main office. So we can look at the role that they hold in the organization and the associated services and applications and resources that's tied to that role. And that's a very common approach. So an example that I put is the sale representative cannot access HR files, right? Um, that's obvious because they don't work in HR. So you can take a look at, you know, departmental type of roles. 
and then you can just drill it down. So normally we would create the user and then add them to a specific group that would be related to the department and then assign the rights to those groups. And then we can also con control the objects by changing the permission instead of controlling the system rights. So the system rights pertaining to your action on the system, right? Things that you can do on the applications, things that you can do on the computer, such as shutting down, rebooting, um, installing, and so on. For the attribute base, attribute really pertains to specific information that will relate to the user. And so attribute base is not as common, but it is assigned the rights based on and that could be your environment. So for example, right, the user is working in branch one and they cannot have access to branch two because the physical environment is physically in branch one, which is at a different location. Or you can use attribute as time, right? The hours that they work in a day. So we can say that, you know, so-and-so works first shift or second shift, and we will block out the rights based on how, when they should access the system and for that system, what type of things that they should access. And then for the rule base, is where the user is assigned rights based on rules. So for example, the user of the systems are granted access to applications that use specific ports. So for example, if I'm allowing the user to run browser application, right, which is a way that they can access the web, if they're allowed to do that, they would use port 80. So rule base is what you normally see with firewall, with intrusion detection system, and so on. We also can set rule that's aligned with specific policy. For example, they're not allowed to attach the USB and be able to transfer file from the USB to the system, right? So that is a rule base where we would disable the physical port, which is the USB port on the operating system side and also on the low level through BIOS, right? So there are a lot of specific ways and sometimes companies would use one or multiple. It really depends on whether one model is gonna address everything that they need. For most part, what I've experienced is that they would have multiple model that's applied, right? As we would, we would see that comprehensive security plan is one that have different ways to solve the problem that will be overlapping. We talked about that last time. Okay, so everybody okay with example and, and the model? Good, make sure we know this. You're gonna see it again and again for different certs. So here I give you a little bit more description. So for the attribute one, you would often see that they would uh, use it for logic base. So it is a way that they would set up a set of rights that's based on certain type of logic. Sometimes that can be used with system because for automation purposes. And it is used when it's flexible or it's context sensitive, right? All right. Um, there's a lot more than this, but your book only mentioned discretionary access control. So discretionary, you see this all the time. When you create a file, you become your creator owner. You own that file, you have full control. So in the operating system, most operating system allows you to have the discretion to assign permission for that file to other people. So, when I right click a file, so for example, if I go here, right, if I right click this file and then I go to its property and I go to the security, as you can see, for me, right, I sign on as my myself or the administrator or even myself as a user when I created this, I have full control. I can also assign other users and other groups as I have discretion to do so, 
right? So the way that we build our, our model in our file access and our container access is to be able to delegate control to the administrator or the owner, right? You often see that the administrator is there because it is the AC. So that means that we have to trust that the administrator have the capability and right the, the security measure to protect our files. So what's the best way to get into your files and folder? Through the administrator account. So escalation of privilege is automatic, right? That's given, okay? All right. So in validating access, and I think this is very responsive, but you have to do this and analysts do this. You have to manually review and validate the roles and the rights. That means that you break out the Excel spreadsheet and the matrix of all the users, <laughs> their roles and the associated system. So um, when I train administrator before, what I do is I make them write down all their users, right? And then I would make them write down the type of system that each of the users use, right? And then from that, we will break it down to, you know, the component, right? Like the object, the files and so on. So you got to look through all of that. Now they have tools to automate all of this now, right? To really kind of gather the information, which are your assets, who are your users and what kind of system they access and be able to give you analytics on that which is great, but we still are required to do manual review because when you have to have the human check and then the machine check. Good. So we talked about that for number 10. And then let's talk about um, different types of attacks. So the true threats in identity access is, you know, these are some of the general area. Your personnel, lack of training, lack of awareness, insider threats, right? The, the people. And human is always a factor in this area. Uh, you know, I was listening on the radio and they were talking about automated cars and how when they, 99% uh, of the accidents was result from the human error. And what they did was they put the scenario of those accidents to the automated cars. And they were saying that the automated cars actually have 1% error. So, you know, we were always concerned about the machine is being unsafe, right? But then on the security side is that if uh, someone hacked into that car, then uh, is that really truly safe? Yeah. Well, they, you know, they're testing right now, especially with logistics, where trucks are being driven by the computer. Um, where, you know, because it's, they're saying that there's shortage in driver at the same time because it's regulated and they can't fill enough drivers. Mm -hmm. And, it, you know, driving long hours can be really difficult for people. So, what they're saying is a lot of the things that they can do, like with transport, with a uh, taxi and things like that can be, you know, so Uber and, and Lyft, they started testing automated cars and, you know, yeah. So it's, you know, it's here. And I think in the next few years, you're going to see more of it. All right. So endpoints. Endpoints are systems that are connecting, right? And so the key things is that you're going to look for Things that can generate exploit, keylogger, malware. Malware comes as keylogger, exploits, administrative rights. Is there local ones that exist on that particular computer or device? And then how the password is stored. That's one of the bigger area, right? If it's storing and saving on a third-party software, is that third-party software compromised? That's always the issue, like secure path or those software, sometimes they have issues and then it turns out that all your credentials are becoming, it's going to get leaked, okay? And then server exploit and then application and services. So a lot of these things that we've seen um, when we talked about layered security already. So for 11, 
it asks you, how are the endpoints used to compromise identity? So in the endpoints, we, you know, the attacker would use exploits. Yeah. Key logger, okay. Uh, local administrative rights. Password and credential storage. And so we need to know all the issues that exist in different areas of our systems, right? Um, and endpoints could also be bring your own device. That could also be laptops. That could also be desktop. There could be other areas. So those are some. And then it, it also talked about the servers. So ultimately, earlier we talked about authentication and LDAP plays a big role in that. So for number 12, it asks you when are LDAP controls not apply? What type of attacks could occur? Oh, I, I think I meant when LDAP controls are not in use or are not applied. What type of attacks could occur? So when you don't have all that control, right? What what can happen is they can attack with your binding. Bless you. So if you install and configure Active Directory before, you would see that there is a last part where it does the binding and the connection. Also, if you don't apply security control, you would see that there will be unencrypted traffic that will be targeted. And they can capture your traffic by simply running a scan and then using exploit kits to be able to capitalize on authentication services. And we saw that some of the, the type of services that we use are openly available and also they have flaws. If you don't have proper access control in LDAP, the attacker would then be able to gain information from your directory and make changes to the directory. For example, adding themselves as a user, right? Changing their privilege from the user account to administrative account. Deleting accounts, deleting the domain administrator from the directory, that's that's a problem, <laughs> right? They can also perform LDAP injection, which is related to web application, because when the user authenticates to the web app, it has to tie back to the directory. And so in that case, the LDAP queries and the user input with them being injected or stuck with different things. So that way they can make changes to their account. For example, changing their shipping address to their own, right? And they don't have to do SQL injection for that. They can do LDAP injection because in the directory, it also contains their general information as well. So it's very important that we protect the directory services on these servers, okay? Especially the LDAP. Okay. So here it talks about different types of attacks, as we mentioned. There should also be a way that they would do denial of service. And so basically denial of service is to make sure the authentication services is unavailable. And so nobody authenticate, nobody can log on to the network, nobody can access resources. That's that's a huge cripple, right? First thing in the on Monday morning, and when you see this happens, yeah, someone's head will roll. <laughs> so usually people scramble and trying to because you're getting all these service ticket coming in, 
asking like why am i not able to log into the network you know i'm pretty sure it's happening if i'm passing correctly this is like a hundred times that i've tried right so now if you're using these type of uh a package or that type of authentication that's open source, they can also perform attacks with redirect, okay? So we're gonna do a little bit of phishing today, kind of give you an idea of how phishing is being performed on OAuth, and it is a redirection. Actually to obtain credential and then redirect. <laughs> There are there are many different types. So there's king phishing. We're going to use square fish today. So, um, all right. Here it talks about Kerberos attack, radius attack, Active Directory attacks. Right. You will have scenario questions on the the certifications that will be focused in different areas of attacks. SCYSA is really addressing like how we can close the vulnerability and how we can reduce the attack surface. So for 13, you just have to identify two to three types of 80 or Active Directory attack. Sorry, I was sleepy when I typed this, so. <laughs> um, they can perform malware placement. So they, they can just install malware on the client or the server system. And that could be a key logger, right? Uh, to capture credential. Use phishing to capture credential. So social engineering is at work here. Then they can also do privilege escalation. And keep in mind, you only have to do two or three, but I list them so that way you know additional. So privilege escalation with Windows exploits. So using you know, exploit kits or um, I show my CS27 how to look for some of the Windows exploits using some of the tools. So here you would see that they can change their account from one level to the next so that way they can access more. They can also take advantage of AD admin account by compromising that login. So once they're in as an admin, it's a lot easier to modify compared to go in as a regular user account and then move themselves into other area. So it's better just to maybe brute force the admin account or find ways to get the admin to give up the credential for that account, which is happening a lot more than brute forcing because brute force, we can see that right away um, through some of our screening system, right? And it will kick out the traffic right away. So I think it's a lot easier to trick the human to give up the information and then access it as an admin and then go in and do other things. So in a lot of these type of attacks, you do see privilege escalation comes up a lot. And it is one of the steps in when you are performing attacks as an ethical uh, pen tester right, ethical hacker, it really capitalized on software vulnerability, okay? That could be innate in the software or it could be the changes that they made that made that software vulnerable. So the best way to do this is to really look at, right, the CVEs, the common vulnerabilities across a lot of these software and then capitalize on that, right? To be able to modify the account and as to move up to the next level of access. And one of the challenges across, I think, for security are the rootkits. And rootkits comes in many forms. Okay. They are just malware, right? Uh, basically programs that would impact or negatively impact different areas. Sometimes rootkits would actually impact specific hardware. A lot of the times it would take advantage of the system resources and do a lot more damage that way. So to really reduce the impact of rootkits, you really need to consider patching applications and OSs. That's first foundation. 
and to really think about how to really implement anti-malware or security software and using whitelisting instead of blacklisting. That means that we would allow specific things. And then looking at behavior through heuristic detection techniques, and that allows you to really see. But keep in mind, I mentioned before, that only about 50 to 60% malware is recognized in the industry. In the wild, there are close to 50% that's not seen or defined. But if we have heuristic detection, anything that's outside of the norm is anomaly and anomaly is bad. So it, you know, the false, the the false positive will also get us through instead of being false negative. Right. I, I feel like it's a lot more um acceptable and and um advice if you were using paranoid mode versus non-paranoid mode right? Ignorant mode is not a good thing. <laughs> so I try to explain to people, my clients all the time, is that we want to make sure that we are um, on the positive end, meaning that we are over cautious versus less. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's going to come up a lot with your with a lot of the questions that you see on this search. Okay. All right. So, and I'm sure that you use this. I use it all the time because I'm tired of putting in a hundred passwords. So sometimes I just want to reset my password, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And it's a lot easier than going through and, and get getting locked out and waiting. So the things that we use a lot and the things that's very convenient, that's automated is the one-time password, your OTP. This is a way that we can validate ourselves. This is the way that we can show that we have the device, right? Some Because the multi-factor is really about something you know, something you are, something you have, somewhere you are, something you do, right? These are the things that, that, that really encompasses multi-factor. And the, the one way that we can do this is with the smartphone. Everybody has a smartphone. So, so the SMS, you have to know that everything comes in plain text. And it passes as plain text. So your OPT, one-time password, it is not a good option for authentication because right, the messages can be stolen and it can be screened. So, you know, if they do have access to your device, likely that they will have your message and they can intercept the message and reroute the message, right? They can put in their number instead of your number. Uh, so if, you know, people can go out of the way to really take that information and do something with it. So is it a really good multi-factor option? No, right? We should use other things. And then, you know, there are administrators talk about email is not a good thing either. So I think, you know, you have to really think about like using possibly characteristic combined with what you have and who you are and what you know, multiple things instead of two. So for 17, how can you really identify attacks? Or I'm sorry, yeah, ident identify identity attacks. So this is, if we are suspecting that someone is impersonating someone else or trying to escalate privilege, these are the things that you need to check. Check for, for privileged account usage, the admin accounts, the people who can do a lot more on that system or the network. We can audit privileged accounts for changes. And in a lot of the operating system or the server, it allows you to enable this audit we can track for successful and failed changes if we look at both area because the failed changes will tell us how many attempts that they did before they got successful. And the successful changes will let us know if they got successful. So for me, I like to do redundant on both sides. Now that takes resources, right? Money and time. So auditing that is twice as long compared to only audit success. What if they failed many times? You would see that in the logs. Uh, what if they are only successful that one time because they investigated? 
right? You would see it in the successful log. So we want to look at the log for the account creation and modification. It, everything has a timestamp, right? We can go back and look. So you need to review the logs and you need to terminate the account that's suspected. So terminate meaning disable, not delete. Okay, so when we say terminate, that means that we put that account on pause, right? You can always recreate another account and control that other account while the jeopardized account needs to be on pause. You don't want to delete it because you cannot investigate it if you delete it. And then we want to do SODs, separation of duties. That means that, you know, if someone create the account, right, they don't audit the account. Someone else audit the account. Because if they are committing fraud, they can create the account. And then when they audit, they just lie. They would say, oh, I didn't find anything. So, and in the IT area, you need to do the same thing. The most dangerous attacker is the insider threat that's in IT because they know the system and they know how to go in and leave without tracing. Okay. So SODs, especially in the technical area, along with other areas. So that's really important. Any question? The chapter is not too bad. I, I like access control, but it's a lot more than the last, right? So access control, you have to remember a lot more things like the models, the protocols, the, you know, but once you know it more and more, you keep reading it and you keep repeating it, it's going to get more familiar and it's going to get easier. Okay. Yeah. Number eight. So on the lab today, there are some part that is simulated. That means that we would, I would tell you what you would do realistically. <laughs> I have to put disclosure on there because this is a form of attack and my video goes on YouTube and there are other people in the world watch my YouTube videos. So I don't want people to say that I'm teaching people how to attack. I'm teaching you so you would know how to prevent attack. And then if you need to perform it to assess your system, you would know how. And that's the whole point in this is for the CYSA is to really do assessment um, from a perspective of a security analyst. And the lab is not too lengthy, right? You can use the one from your drive or you can just download it fresh. Okay, if we're done. We can save and submit your assignment, but you can also wait until Sunday uh, to do that. Yeah, last Sunday I got, I graded all my five classes in one sitting. and I was so proud of myself because the other classes are like almost 50 students each. I finished at two something. Yeah. So your class was the last because it's 40 something, right? It's just chronological I order. Still, and I was like, mm, she's still grading. Yeah. I, I was grading through. So I was, I started with 11 and I went to seven. I had two sections of seven. Then I went to 27 and then 41. So I made sure and, and I had a glass of wine. So that also no. helped. <laughs> <laughs> I was I was very motivated to complete. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Um I'm gonna switch screen share now. And so let's go here. And now I'll try to keep up. So, because when I fall two weeks behind on grading, it's always so difficult. Let me re-download it because I don't have it on this computer. Okay, so you can always download your Kali Linux. It's going to come down uh, in the folder downloads like this, whether you do it at school or at home. And then you can right click and then do unzip. I'm gonna extract files onto my desktop. So that way 
um, I have a fresh one because I have one that's running. So let me shut this one down and then restart the other one with you. X, no. I thought about putting, like, having us do a Windows server and then attacking against that Windows server. Maybe down the line we'll do that when we, when we have more time. Lately, Wednesday, I've been having meetings before class, so. Okay. Still hanging on to my Linux. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go here and then I'm going to remove only. I'm going to go ahead and add my desktop ones. I'll start it. All right. So let's take a look at the lab. Thank you. Okay, so we talked a little bit about OAuth um, and for disclosure, right? I am not teaching you how to fish. This is a technique that we use for education purposes only. Any illegal attempt outside of class, I'm not liable for. So just putting it out there. Part A, we're gonna install OAuth. And so I want you to know how to do that. And in Linux, it's super easy. You need to have root privilege, however, because um, at one point, if you don't, you have to modify the configuration file. And, you know, you can do chmod and you just need to do read and execute. Um, but it's just save some step and reduce to the soup. So once your Kali is loaded, you just log in. These. Then we're gonna open up our we're gonna open up our terminal by clicking this black square. Then we're gonna do sudo su. So we elevate our account to root. And I mentioned this is this purpose is for to configure the file later. Okay. So we can do wget and you can this is used to download but you can, uh, yeah, I tried to do get tool before, but they had moved some stuff around. So we are gonna download an extension package called pair. And of course you can copy and paste, okay? So if you do research on it, pair is, it encompasses this extension encompasses the OAuth. It works really well with authentication and other things. Um, and so once we have the pair extension for PHP, right, um, we are going to do an update. And if you don't do the update, it will fail. Okay. So sudo app get update, or you can do sudo install update. You don't have to do pseudo actually, because you're on this group. Okay, so once you have that, we're going to do the libraries. Okay, so there are three libraries that you are gonna get. And if you look at this, this is a GCC. If you ever seen this before, it's because you probably use C compiler, okay? So what these are, are they are C-based library. Uh, it's written in the C language and you need C compiler, GCC to compile it. 
So we need an auto conk library libc for development and then the uh the lib pcre3 for development okay and these libraries are needed in order for us to install the others right normally you can also put this on the requirement.txt file and then be able to install that but uh Okay, so we're good there, right? And then once we uh, once we have that, then we're just gonna do the PHP OAuth. So this is where we actually install, right? All of this stuff is the preparation before we install. And we're gonna just press Y to say yes to install, and it's gonna take a few seconds. So we're good. So now you already have it, okay? So when you do that, what's gonna happen is going to put your PHP off and in the last one, you already saw this, we were here, right? Uh, PHP 8.2, it puts it in the ETC directory. So what we need to do is we need to move into that and we're gonna access the CLI. So once you're here, and if you're not sure, you can always do LS, right? Okay. So what I need to do is I need to make modification of my comp file. And the best practice, you should recopy it, right? But I'm just saving a step here. So you're going to do a nano comp dot D. Oh, I'm sorry. Actually, you don't need the nano. It's just a blank file. You can do a bash C, this part. I was trying to do multiple type of ways. Okay, so you don't need to do the nano part of number nine. Just do this, the bash C. And then once you, once you so what you're doing here is you are appending this text into the configuration file and then save it as the INI, okay? And then after that, for the second command, and this is two command, you are going to open up the directory and you're gonna start Apache. And it should tell you Apache restart service there, okay? Then we want to verify to see if PHP OAuth is working. So what you're doing is you are accessing PHP and then when you use a grep, right, you're filtering that out and you want to be able to look for OAuth. So and it tells you, right, even though it says that oh it's running this INI. It loads some kind of unknown module, but it does support OAuth and it is enabled. So you know it's working. So we need to see this part to make sure it works. Any question? Okay. Now, ideally you saw last week that we use different tools for when you see a um, PHP based tool or Apache tool, a lot of them are in Ruby. So it's probably a good idea to install Ruby OAuth 2, right? In the case that if you need to test it somehow, um, you have that Ruby package available for OAuth. So I have that now. 
and then I can take the screen capture I did install so your install successful. The only modification we did was we didn't have to do this nano one for number nine. And this part is actually just more information than you actually uh, do the steps, right? So there are tons of different phishing tools. There are some that are related to OAuth. And one of the newer one that you see in the industry is Squarefish. So Squarefish is a tool that use OAuth device code um, for authentication and QR codes, okay? What you're gonna do with this tool is you're gonna generate a fake email, which is what phishing is, that has the QR on it, and you're gonna trick the user to type in their authentication and then send it to you, okay? So there's some link about fish, fish in suites. There are other options that you can use. So it's very similar to some of the, the other tool, but in this one, it's gonna use OAuth device code for a phishing attack. And the attacker is gonna use the email module, which is a file, and it is a Python file uh, in Squarefish to send a malicious QR code to the victim. Now, if you really, really wanna test this, set up a, a fake email account, right? Could be like for, on outlook.com and then actually use that account when I'll show you the field when you put it in uh, and then set up the pretext. And we'll talk about the, the pretext. So the default pretext is just like, you know, it tells the user that, oh, they just need to have multi-factor authentication. And this is done a lot in regular network even here, right? So it sends them a link uh, and then they click on it and then they type in their username and password to authenticate and then it sends them a text and then they would use that, you know, the OPT code and then enter it into another field. So it's going to send them an, a fake MFA authentication message to their smartphone, like the iPhone or, you know, it ha I think they have two versions, uh, one regular and one iPhone, and then they would be able to set up, give you the client ID and Microsoft authentication app. Okay, so it's gonna look like this. Okay. And I stole this from their website or their Git. <laughs> so when they scan the QR code, right, uh, they're gonna get the email body on the mobile device. So they'll get the email. And then the, the QR is gonna direct the victim to your control server, right? We don't we don't have a full server up, but I can show you where you can put that information in. And then you would use the URL parameter to set up the email address. Now the RFC for this, right? If you wanna read the full detail, this is not malicious in the implementation. It is a way that, you know, there is a vulnerability in configuration and it's leveraging the device authorized server for this. Sorry, I have a typo here. Um, if you read the RFC, this is the section that you need to go to for, and it talks about how remote phishing authorization uh, is operating because of the lack of configuration. So if you, you fix this problem, you fix the phishing part. Okay. So to get Squarefish, you can go to their website, right? They would give you this information or there are tons of other information online on Squarefish. Not all of them are accurate, however, right? So what you're gonna do is you are gonna use Git to pull Squarefish. Not a big package. And then after that, you're gonna change the directory inside into its folder here. So we're going to move into the directory Squarefish. Oh, I cloned it there. Sorry. I should CD it back out. But anyway, 
And then I'm going to do a pip install requirement text. This is going to pull all their stuff. Uh, so yeah, on the last one, it should have been done this way. So it tells me that, you know, when I'm on as a root, this is not recommended uh, and so on based on Pippa, right? So once I got that in, I'm ready to run. All you need is Python 3, okay? Um, now Linux, most Ubuntu, Debian-based Linux system have 3.10 at least or higher install. I know the new Kali, if you update it, it's 3.11, okay? So... We're gonna use Python to run it. So this is Squarefish, right? And it tells me right here that you need to, it's missing the email information because I didn't put it, I didn't configure it to put in the user email. So this is the email is where your target's gonna be, right? Like who are you sending it to? And they that could be like, uh, we can import in a CSV, so it's gonna go one after the other, it's just gonna keep plugging in. So that's an easy Python script, right? We just loop it and then just keep adding the email address next on the list, next on the list from the CSV file. And this is how they generate a bunch of fakes. Uh, phishing email that's that's coming out to all the, the compromised email address, right? So what, what we would need to do here is that you need to use some form of email address. And if you want to test this in the validity way, you have to put in a, you know, a test email address, right? And then the field that you need to change are this section here. And it will look something like this. All right, and to configure it, you would go here. So you would do a nano, settings uh, dot con config and it would look like this. All you have to do is use your arrow key to go down, right? You notice how, how um, and we're putting in arbitrary information here, right? Realistically, you would put in real things here, right? If you want to perform an attack, let's say that you are hired to do an engagement for a company and you're trying to see if you know, the executive will fall for your phishing email, right? Easy, put in their email address, okay? You can go and send it up here. So you see how they put the blank ones here? So you just move your cursor, oops. You just move your cursor down or up. It's like, let me get back to it. This, all right. So I would put in the SMTP email here. For example, I can say executive one at email. Yeah, that's fake, right? Okay, now when you after you set this, and if it's not real, it just tell you it's failed. Okay. But if it's real and it sends it, it's gonna be successful. It's gonna say successful if it's received. And then the password, your SMTP password. So actually, this is the sender. So you know that you would set up a fake account, right? Uh, you know, through one of those email service. And then um, your SMTP password is sender password. Yeah, it's it's basically your user account, right? That you're sending it. <clears throat> now for the Squarefish server, that's the actual. So this this server that we set OAuth on, right, cannot be the Squarefish server. A Squarefish server would have a DNS and a web, right? Um. So it's basically when they when they use that QR code, they're gonna connect to our server and they're gonna supply their credential to our server. That's what we want. 
So you have to enable Apache if it's on Linux or IIS on Windows, and then you just install or enable DNS on Linux and or Windows, okay? And that's, you know, let's assume that it's Linux, like this system, we just need to enable Apache, which we did, and then enable DNS and register that as a public server or find someone to host our server, right? So here is where you would put this domain, um, right? And this is an actual URL that you, you have it hosted, okay? And then once you fill that out and you can check out all the other configuration, okay? See how it, there's a cert CRT, that's also blank and cert key. So in some cases you need to put in your cert information, your certificate information. And that's what you put. So that will be like a string or just your cert value, right? Your key value and your cert value. So you just look at the property of your certs and you insert it, you copy and paste it there. So once I'm done, I would save it, right? And then I would run it. And it's gonna try to attempt, it tells me it's failed because, right, I don't really have a real target, right? I don't have a server, but it does say, it tells me it's back credential, there's some information about, you know, your SMTP that's not working. So you can simply go in and fix the configuration file. So the point in this is to show you the procedure on how someone will be able to use something like this to generate a QR phishing email that sends. And it's really easy. It doesn't take very long as long as they have legitimate target and legitimate server to, to, to begin with. Okay. Let's talk about pretext. So in pretext, what this is, is a way that you would kind of get the, the people to believe you based on building a trust with some information that you want to give to them, right? Um, so the victim would get some kind of information. You want to give them some information. You want to allow them to confirm any kind of uh, victim's identity. And we simply divulge the information so that way they can trust us, okay? So sophisticated pre pretext attacks is really to trick the victims to perform a certain action that allows us to exploit, whether it's physical or it's logical. And so you want to also pressure them into doing it and give them a short period of time because the longer it takes, the longer that they take, right? They will figure it out. So normally when you see a lot of the phishing thing is they urge you to do it right away, right? Um, you know, like job that looks really real and also like, you know, it's look very tempting and there's limited time, okay? <laughs> and so in order to do some pretext, you already install Squarefish, it's already there. So for, um, You can't get it from here, actually. Actually, yeah. See so pretext. And then if you do LS on it, you would see that it has the iPhone and the MFA. So if you want to target iPhone, you you would use the template inside this directory. MFA is for multi-factor authentication, like the Microsoft one we looked at, uh, as the picture. Right, so what you see is if you want the iPhone, I would go into the iPhone directory. So right now I'm going to I'm gonna sorry, I forgot to tell you guys to go to MFA, huh? <laughs> so let's do that. you can use the iPhone one. So we're going to do CD, MFA. And then in there, you'll be, otherwise it's going to throw an error here. Okay. So you are going to do nano uh, QR. 
code, email, HTML. So most of your, most of the, the web email application that you see, like for your Gmail and your, you know, if you're using Yahoo Outlook and so on, um, it's formatted with HTML. Very rare, like Canvas messages, plain text is, <laughs> it's not HTML. So, you know, you can't not format it. So this is the content. It tells you that your Microsoft Authenticator token has expired. The device code for your Microsoft Authenticator app. Your code will be emailed to you, uh, blah, 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 after you enter it. So it looks very real, right? It might have images and things like that, which is what you see here, your QR code, and so on. So when you look at the content of the email, right, it has a believable message that the authenticator token is broken and they need to re they need to resupply their their credential. It has an image of your QR code. There's like some background color. It's very believable. And that's what you want. So they give you this template. Okay. And to use the template, and they can also scan the device. So basically, I want you to take a look at the template. And then um, if you exit it, if you're interested, you can go back. And oh. uh, let's go plain text icon. See, um, is there PHP equal to? I've got it buried all the way in. CLI. iPhone, S, CD, uh, yeah. device, oh, email, uh, HTML. So on the iPhone side, you see that it, it shows that your iPhone device code is, right, and it has this right here that allows us to tie it back to the QR. So it's the same link being processed. And then enter. Now we want to target the user that has Microsoft stuff. Otherwise this doesn't look good. So you can go in and you can create other file. So the point in this is to make an HTML file that is correlated to what you're trying to, you're trying to obtain from, right? Okay, so then go back to CD and then go back to Squarefish, Squarefish. So I want to show you that there's this thing called the utility Python file. And what this does is allows you to modify the header. So that way um, you can remove the header. So that allows you to I guess, get response better, okay? So you can modify this. So the server information uh, and so on. So you can add in some of the information like this. So let me exit. And then I can come back to here to the root. I'm gonna go ahead and do CD. Actually, I buried it a little bit, so. Fish again. Okay. So make sure that we're in the right path. And then we're going to do nano utils. Oh, I'm sorry. It has to have the dot py, otherwise, it's going to do a dot text file. So this is it. 
So it should look something like this. And then what you do is you're gonna go down just like before, right? Use your cursor or your arrow down to go down and you're gonna edit. Uh, so it tells me that for very, right? Accepting encoding, so that's good. Server Microsoft IIS 10.0, that's good. TLS version point, uh, 1.3. That's fine. That matches content type, HTML char set, UTF, X version, same as origin, IEH. So you got to make sure that all your parameter in this area is like aligned with this. If it's different, then we can change it. Also, if you want to change it on your own, this is the maximum age right for the header for the http header so when it submits it um, to the web it's going to use this information it's going to plug it into the script and that's what it does okay so transport security max h so if everything is the same then you know you don't have to resave it but you can modify this so my my point in this is you can simply modify your square fish, right? Configuration file along with what you're doing here is the HTTP header that is getting submitted, okay? And then this is the code right here. For logging and all of those things. It's a function. So once we're done, we can save, control X, Y, enter, and then we can rerun the Python. So as you go through, you can modify different things to be able to retest your phishing, right? So square fish, they call it squish.py, but when you use python-m, you don't have to use .py. Oh, I'm sorry, I have to go to the right directory. Space that dot get you back one, and then you can run this. And of course, it's going to tell me failed because I don't have the right email address, right? But you get the point in that we modify a few things configuration file and HTTP header. Once we do that, right, in the configuration file, we put in the proper email address and uh, and so on and then we'll be able to execute so when i put user at email.com that's actually you want to put for the target and if you are successful in sending that email for the victim it would say success here so all of that is done in the configuration file the the pretext stuff we will we want to be able to modify it in the content of our template and also in the header that's your pretext Okay, and then with that, take a screenshot for your lab submission. We should answer these questions. What did you learn about OAuth? Right, you can click the link on your notes and it takes you to OAuth. It talks about what it is, why is it important in identity and access management. It's used in a lot of different things from single sign on all the way to uh, sharing credential across multiple services like your web, right? And why we should protect it, okay? Describe how phishing attack, like using Squarefish, can be used to export the identity of the access. So what is Squarefish doing, right? What are we trying to do with Squarefish? What are we trying to get from the user? And how are we getting it from the user? Okay, so read the section on, on the labs to scroll back up and look up. I put down what Squarefish does, right? What are the steps in obtaining the credential with Squarefish? So once you answer these two questions, right, you can save and then be able to submit. Any questions? All right. And then we can always back up our Kali after we shut it down.
We'll stop recording.